Thanks very much, John. Uh, that was a, a masterly presentation of, um, I think, um, which I think rebuts many of the arguments that have been uh, made over the years, um, uh, which attempt to justify the use of nuclear weapons, um, and particularly the first use of nuclear weapons in uh, 1945. I'm going to say something now about the medical effects of nuclear war. Um, uh, the city of um, Hiroshima stands on a flat plateau on the Japanese island of Honshu. At 8.15 a.m. on the morning of the 6th of August, uh, 1945, a free-fall bomb was dropped from a B-29 bomber um, uh, called the Enola Gay. It exploded 500 meters above the center of the city in a busy residential and business area which was crowded with people going about their daily business. This was a new type of bomb with enormous destructive power. Its yield of around 12,000 12, um, 12, tons of TNT it was several thousand times more powerful than any previous conventional bomb. And the difference didn't just lie in the destructive power from, from a, a single bomb. It was different because it was a weapon of indiscriminate mass slaughter. Unable to distinguish between soldiers and civilians, a weapon that would wipe out everything in its path, overwhelmingly civilians in this case. It was the ultimate in anti-personnel and anti-human weapons. We've already established that the terrain of, of Hiroshima was that of a flat plateau, uh, so that after the um, bomb was exploded, unimpeded by hills or other natural features that could limit the blast, the fireball that was created by that single bomb went on to destroy 13 square kilometers of a city. Half of the energy generated by uh, atomic weapons is given off as blast. The rest, 50%, uh, sorry, 35% is heat, and ionizing radiation, 15%. In Hiroshima, the epicenter of the explosion reached a temperature of several million degrees centigrade, creating a, a heat flash over a wide area, vaporizing all human tissue. Um, and so, within a radius of half a mile of the city, uh, of the center of the blast, every person was killed. All that was left of people who were caught out in the open was their shadows burnt into uh, stone. So this, um, beyond this central area, um, people were killed by heat and blast waves, either in the open or inside buildings that were collapsing and bursting into flames. In the area immediately, in, in this area, uh, the, the immediate death rate was 90%. Um, the firestorm created hurricane, in, hurricane force winds which spread and intensified the fire. 63% of the buildings of Hiroshima were completely destroyed and a further 30% were badly damaged. The total number of deaths, it's difficult to be certain, but there's been a number of estimates and revisions of that over the years. Um, the best estimates today, I think, are that in Hiroshima, 75,000 people uh, died in the first few hours, um, 140,000 had died by the end of the year, and by the end of that decade, by 1950, uh, 200,000 was the death toll. Many of those who survived the immediate blast died shortly afterwards from fatal burns. Many of those not killed initially would have suffered uh, horrific injuries from blast, collapsing buildings, flying debris, um, burns, um, all, all manner of things. The injuries included lacerations, abrasions, crush injuries, fractures, first, second and third degree burns. Tens of thousands of people therefore were badly injured and needing immediate medical care. But of course there was no medical care because the medical services had been destroyed along with everything else. Um, so the nurses and the doctors, many of them had died um, along with it and the whole infrastructure, medical infrastructure, had, had been destroyed at the same time. So effectively, very little help was available. In the biggest Red Cross hospital um, in the city, only six doctors out of 30 were able to function and only 10 nurses out of 200. So very soon these people these um, care work and these kind of care attendants um, were overwhelmed by the demand. Uh, patients who slowly filled the hospital, occupying every bed and ultimately occupying every inch of floor space. So in other words, what you're looking at here is the complete breakdown of rescue and medical services. Within two to three days, radiation uh, victims began to appear. People who were near the epicenter developed symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, bloodstained diarrhea and hair loss. Most of these people died the same week. The radiation victims who were further away from the centre developed symptoms one to four weeks after the explosion. 
and those hit particularly severely were the foetuses of pregnant women. Many of them were born stillborn. They had a very high infant mortality rate at that time um, after the explosion. It, 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 a lot of children were born with abnormally small skulls, a condition called microcephaly, and along with that went mental disabilities. You began to see an increase in the rates of leukaemia uh, about two years after the attack, and that peaked four to six years later, again affecting mainly children. Higher rates of solid tumours, uh, cancer, began to arise um, around 10 years after exposure and became common after 1960. The main cancers that were generated by this were thyroid cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer and salivary gland cancer. And there was a direct correlation between the distance from the atomic bomb um, and the risk and rate of cancer. These first atomic bombs, um, the first generation were called atomic bombs, they were fission bombs where the aim was to uh, trigger and sustain a fission chain reaction which produced very high levels of energy in a very, very short time. And the, the fissile material that they used, as John has already said, was um, uranium-235 in the case of Hiroshima and plutonium-239 in the case of Nagasaki. Very interesting why they used different bombs, different types of bombs, um, in different scenarios. It was about part of a larger experiment. That's really what it was about. Which I think helps to echo the points that John was making. The other important impact of these early bombs, which is true to all nuclear weapons, is something called the electromagnetic pulse, or EMP, which is a short burst of intense electromagnetic energy which damages all electronic equipment and disrupts its functions. And, and, and obviously that's uh, for the, the attacking nation, like one of the key things is to be able to knock out the ability of the um, a attacked nation to be able to respond in terms of communication and to be able to organise some sort of resistance or, um, or some sort of response. Um, so this would damage not only military and civilian um, communication systems, but it would damage uh, almost all medical equipment as well in the modern day. Um, modern nuclear weapons, of course, are much more powerful than these early uh, atom bombs. They're called H-bombs or thermonuclear weapons and they use fission and fusion. The fission stage, which is the, um, the stage used by the early weapons, is used to create huge amounts of energy to trigger the, um, the, the fusion stage. And that is used because you can produce far more, far bigger bombs in a more controlled way. So um, the, the, the warheads and Trident missiles, for example, are eight times as powerful as those in the bomb used in Hiroshima. So if you want to know what would happen if these weapons were used today, you should read the pamphlet um, Scottish CND pamphlet, If Britain Fired Trident, written by our own John Ainsley in 2013. Unfortunately, we don't have any copies of it. You can see it online, you can certainly read it online, uh, but um, that's something that we're going to have to reprint, I think. And it's an estimate of what would happen if a single Trident submarine launched a boatload of warheads at Moscow. And this was the uh, um, strategic scenario which was uh, adopted uh, certainly in the 1980s. Um, second biggest city in Europe, city of 11.5 million, um, and the estimate was that if uh, 40 warheads from a single side of submarine were launched in Moscow, um, you would, uh, the, the death rate would be 5.4 million people would die uh, within a few days of the blast, um, as a result of blast burns and radiation. Fatality rates would be 95% for those within 1.6 kilometers of each explosion, and very high levels of radioactive fallout because they would be using ground burst explosions to try and disrupt um, communications and underground bunkers. Uh, all of that would be uh, an important part of the, uh, the process. And that in itself would produce huge additional um, amounts of radioactivity, which would, be, um, which would present as fallout within a few days. So in other words, the horrors that we saw in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Nagasaki would be pretty small fry in comparison to the horrors that we uh, might see in a nuclear war scenario today uh, that would face, for example, the people of Moscow if they had to be, if they were attacked. And as in 1945, the Red Cross have argued that the casualties would completely overwhelm the ability of medical services to react. As in Hiroshima, very little help would be available. Medical staff would be quickly overcome um, and they would have to make decisions about who to treat and who not to treat. Difficult decisions um, at the best of times, but under these circumstances, um, uh, unbearable almost. 
So I, I do realise that this subject is a depressing subject, um, uh, and uh, we we do as a campaign try to avoid uh, too much shock horror stuff uh, because it can sometimes alienate people. But I think it's important on an occasion like this to remind ourselves of exactly what these weapons do, what they're there for, what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and what could happen if they were ever used uh, today. Um, and I think it emphasises that using these weapons is a crime against humanity, but if it's a crime against humanity to use them, it's also a crime against humanity to possess them with a view to using them. And uh, uh, that's, I think, is the main message I think we have to take home from today. So that's, uh, that's quite enough for me, I think. Um, I'm now going to ask Arthur Johnson to come and give us a song. I'm not sure if I'll need this microphone, but I'll stand here anyway. And when I see things like this, I always like to say, I'm glad there's so many of you still here. <laughs> I was four years old when this happened, and was brought up as a kid, everything. But I never get involved with CND, it was about 18, 19. And at that time, most of the, the big demos were beginning to die down. But I'd say to you, I'm what we wanted. One or two songs. Can we get? Uh, can we take two songs? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> As you know, my songs are all about eight minutes long anyway. <laughs> Last night I had the strangest dream I've never dreamed before. I grant the world had all agreed to put an end to war. I dreamt I saw a mighty room, and the room was full of men, and the papers they were signing said with When the papers were all signed and a million copies made, we all joined hands and bowed our heads, and grateful prayers were said. Then the people in the streets below were dancing. Last night I had the strangest dream I'd never dreamed before. I dreamt the world had all agreed to put an end to war. the audience that will know this one. This was, well to me it was always a, the anthem for all the CND marches. Can't you hear the H-bomb thunder echoes like the crack of doom while it tears the skies asunder fall and makes this world a tomb do you want your homes to tumble, rise in smoke towards the sky? Would you see your cities crumble? Would you let your children die? Men and women stand together. Do Tell the leaders of 
the nations. Let the whole wide world take heed. Poison from the radiation strikes at a rare race and creed. Would you put mankind in danger? Murder folk in distant lands. Would you bring death to a stranger? Have his blood upon your hands. It's a protest song. Men and women stand together. Do as he always does. Can I just ask um, Mary Millington to come up and uh, make a short announcement? Um, today I went into Toll Cross Park near where I live and there's a lovely gardener there who let me pick some rose petals. I've got a great big bag of pink rose petals from Toll Cross Park. I very much like company. I'm going to walk down to the Clyde and strew the petals in the Clyde in memory of those victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If anyone would like to come with me, meet me in about five minutes just inside the door downstairs, the front door. Very good. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, it just remains for me to thank everyone who contributed towards tonight. Uh, for what's been a very successful event, I think. Thanks particularly to Glasgow City Council for hosting the event, uh, for the Lord Provost, Sadie Doherty, for her very welcoming uh, welcome, um, uh, to Chris for his um, poems, uh, his, his contributions, to Eddie for his, um, his, uh, his wonderful music, um, and to John Ainsley for his um, uh, rendition of the historical context. Not exactly a rendition, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, and to Arthur, of course, for bringing the, the event to, to, to a conclusion. So thank you very much to all of you for coming along, because that's what's really